We've got a special guest, Shauna uh, Casey is in the house, joining us from Seattle. Uh, her and I are gonna share a nice conversation together uh, about micro learning, micro schools, entrepreneurship, education. Uh, and so appreciate everyone who's joined us. Uh, Shauna, to, to kick things off, I think there'd be value in um, just kind of giving us an, an overview of not being in education necessarily. I wasn't as familiar with micro learning uh, and, and not, not to mention micro schools. Uh, so how do you describe uh, this type of environment to children? Ooh, I like that twist at the end. Um, so, you know, kids, kids don't know any different. So that's actually, a, I, I haven't been asked that question before. I, you know, I would, um, I would really say, uh, there is a magical place in your neighborhood where you're going to get a chance to learn and it's tailored just for you. And you're going to have friends there and you're going to have fun and you're going to learn through all kinds of different projects. Um, that's probably how I describe it to a kid. <laughs> Now, now shifting gears uh, into micro learning and, and maybe thinking about the audience of educators, is that something that is commonplace? Is it something that is emerging? Like this concept of micro learning is a term I'm hearing a lot of, but I, I, I don't feel like I had ever heard of it even a couple years ago. Yeah, you know, micro schools, um, which, is, which is used you know, more commonly than micro learning, it really was a model that existed before the pandemic um, that that was gaining a lot of traction. Um, and and then I think with the pandemic and all the tailwinds that we saw coming, you know, the various reasons, not just safety, but 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 safety being the number one reason, it really emerged as and it kind of had this moment in time. I know even, you know, as as a small early stage startup, you know, less than a year old, we we had, you know, we were featured in a bunch of different media outlets, which normally as a startup that stage, you would never be, uh, you know, on the Today Show and Bloomberg and everything talking about learning, but really everybody was looking for alternative options. So it's really, um, and the basis of it is really um, small group learning. Oftentimes it's in neighborhood. Um, a lot of times people refer to it as sort of back to the one room schoolhouse. Um, our programs and a lot of the other programs out there are about, uh, you know, and some of these are just community based um, or co op based are usually eight kids or less. Um, and they're not always in in a home. Sometimes they are, we, they're in businesses, sometimes they're in small commercial spaces, but the idea is it's a smaller class size with more personalized learning. So it's in person. Is there also some online components when you have the smaller groups collaborating together? Yeah, there can be, you know, oftentimes those aren't those aren't usually termed micro school because a lot of times uh, or micro learning um, because a lot of times those are, you know, th that's much more common the online um, the focus, the, the term micro school usually refers to in person. That's interesting. That's interesting. I guess when I think of a new term, I just assume there's some online components. Uh, and so my question uh, is perhaps a little naive, but like, how do you feel uh, online uh, learning uh, and, and the, what we've learned even in the past year or so can support, enhance, optimize, add efficiency uh, to in-person gatherings and vice versa? How can in-person interactions fuel a more engaging online experience? Yeah, you know, um... There are really so many ways that we've seen and you know this has just been a giant experiment and to use your term like experiment gone right in some ways and you know in other ways it's been really, really painful for so many families and so many kids. Um, but some of the bright spots I think that we're seeing coming out of this is like even next fall, a lot of the schools across the country are looking at a hybrid option because parents are asking for it, so there might be some in person and some remote and and so we're sort of seeing this this more flexibility with schooling coming out of this and that is really surprising and as many of you know who who are here today who have all kinds of experience i mean who would have ever thought we'd be in a place where public schools are now offering hybrid learning and so i'm talking here mainly about k through 12. um and my, our focus is is mostly early child education we do have some early elementary programs with with our with ours but um you know being being in this industry i have a pretty good view on sort of of, of what's been happening um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is I think that there's it opens up access for what some people call high voltage tutoring. 
meaning that you can really go deep in a subject that your teacher at school might not are, might not be familiar with. And so you have access. I mean, we had this access before, but now it's just so much more widely used. Um, for instance, learning a language or a unique skill or almost like interning per se, you know, getting a chance to intern earlier in, in, a, in or shadow people at work. Um, and so those are some of the things that I think are interesting. The other thing that's interesting is, and, and I know we were talking a little bit then about some of the benefits, um, this idea of supplementing school. So there's, there's this huge emergence now in game-based learning. And it's, you know, there's people on one side who love it and think it's the future of, of 100% school. And there's others who feel like it's actually, you know, worrisome in some ways. But, but I think the, the idea, the spirit with it is that kids are able to learn how to do critical thinking at the earliest years. And so a lot of that is happening online, this game-based learning. And one of the most um, well-known that's emerging is <laughs> one of Elon Musk's projects, um, Astra Nova, a school that he created inside the, um, his, his plant, his rocket plant. Um, and one of the startups that came out of that is one called, um, oh gosh, it came out of Astra Nova, but it's, it's essentially online game-based learning. And um, that one- Synthesis? Synthesis, yeah, synthesis school. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting is like we're starting to see some of the school districts doing some things like um, like some of the health screenings and things can be done by an expert remotely. And that's that, you know, sort of exists because of cost savings, because there already was like sort of a shortage of having a nurse at every school. Um, so some of those types of things, I think we're seeing efficiencies emerge and new interesting ways that kids can learn you know, in both ways emerging. I hadn't thought about the specific services within an educational environment and perhaps some shortages uh, being solved uh, through telehealth as an example, right? Um, that's interesting, interesting. Well, uh, thanks for providing uh, some thoughts on that. And uh, Michael uh, has joined us here today and uh, was the first person to introduce me to synthesis. And I, as a parent was going through this like, you know, all these conversations are so interesting, uh, but as a parent, I'm also more like sensitive to uh, this small child about to hit the educational system. And so I started to feel like this sense of like this weight that, oh, I needed to go in and really make sure that these kids were getting all that they could and just knowing the potential of humans uh, with all these conversations with entrepreneurs. And, and it, it almost was like this sense of peace, uh, the supplementation allowing uh, students uh, to explore some of these areas of interest. Um, and uh, this isn't a negative, but just looking at school as, as playing the game well, and then going beyond the system to truly uh, explore areas that they're going to get passionate about, uh, potentially even explore entrepreneurial ventures around. Uh, and so I think uh, there might be a good segue here, uh, Shauna, to like ask you a little bit, maybe, maybe tactics if you want, but just generally too. What's the value in blurring the line between the classroom and, uh, you know, the business environment, the startup community, the real world? Well, you know, to kind of go way back here, which I think we, we touched a little bit on this on your last uh, caffeinated conversation, which I loved, is this idea that originally the education system was built to support children with the industrial age. And so when you think about back to sort of where we started with education and the fact that you know in 100 years a lot of us who are even working in this field felt like it didn't change very much um, and change is hard and you know, it, you know it's just one of the industries where um, we're trying little experiments here and there and so i think you know there's a there's a line of thought in this industry with people who are who are working on startups that in some ways, the traditional or existing school system doesn't support kids really in their own individual creativity. Um, and, and in many ways, creates a level of standardization that is tough for some parents and, 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 and a lot of us working in the startup field. So I know that might be controversial in this field, but in this, in this group, because there, we're, we have so many different backgrounds, but it is, you know, this is really emerging as something coming out of the pandemic that people feel like that this, you know, we need change here and we need to see, we need to figure out what, what that looks like. And I think that's one of the reasons why this hybrid approach in some school districts is coming out and parents are asking for it and demanding it. And then parents are taking more of an active role 
as sort of another educator like they never have before because they've had to and they've realized that this actually it works for them to be a supplemental educator oftentimes doesn't work for them to be the main educator <laughs> that was pretty painful for some families um but i think this hybrid approach you know kind of back to that back to like how how the education at least in the united states the system started the hybrid approach the blending allows children in many ways to follow what their own individual interests are and when they're doing that and when they're doing it in the right way with the right kind of technology then all of a sudden their attention spans look different you know all of a sudden their their interest level looks different you know um so i feel like that if, if we can keep that spirit and figure out how to work together on that then i think you know we're going to come out of this um with a lot of a lot of the benefits of this change that's interesting. You mentioned it allows folks to lean into their interests, and it would seem as though without the, uh, you know, the the barriers of location, uh, that ability to import knowledge, export knowledge, connect with folks much further than your local school district, um, even if it's the town ne nearby or somewhere across the state or around the globe, like uh, collaborating uh, in that way feels like some some fresh energy. Uh, so that's interesting. I thinking about some of the history that you have um, in the startup world uh, within corporate America, I'm curious how that work has impacted your perspective on education. And then maybe um, as a follow up thought, knowing we might have entrepreneurs, uh, also educational uh, leaders uh, tuning in. How, how, what's the what's the value for folks that decide to, you know, learn, earn, and then give back, going back and, and accelerating students? I know it's kind of a two-piece question there, but uh, I'll let you uh, riff on those two thoughts for a moment. Well, I'll take the first one, and I might need some clarification on the second one. I think, uh, gosh, those are such good questions. You are so good, Ben. Um, I would say like and this is more of a, per, a maybe a personal note, but I remember working in the corporate world, um, at some of these, you know, massive companies and um, I, I was, I tended to be the person that would try to do things differently. And usually the way that I did that was an experiment um, that had clear parameters and then a clear way to measure it. And then I was able to get this buy in to try to do things differently. And I did, you know, I was able to do that at Comcast at Nordstrom. And so eventually like, you know, my, my title was like, you know, uh, head of uh, innovation or digital media. And so I was able to kind of, in some ways kind of create my own position. And I think that's a lot harder to do sometimes in the institutional education field, but we can still do experiments. We can still try things, small experiments. We can still try things differently. Um, and I think so maybe that's one thing that 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 sort of is in the back of my head is even with you know big existing um, institutions, we can still try small things to do things differently and measure the impact and then and you know and then share the knowledge really. And I think you know you're seeing a lot of that during the pandemic with all these different models um, popping up. But yeah, your second question was, um, T tell me more about your second question. Well, thinking about an entrepreneur's perspective, um, I always find it so energizing to be around students, uh, to share you know, my two regrets of not starting a company earlier and not understanding the value of an engaged network. I'm so quick uh, to get passionate because it's just like almost out of envy. These folks have such an yeah. earlier uh, interaction with the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so thinking about the entrepreneur or the person uh, who has uh, you know, exited the education. We should always, you know, perpetual learning, micro learning for all, right, all the time. But is is there something that like resonates when it when you think about what ge what generates for for the value of going back and uh, accelerating students? We have so many educators mm -hmm. on the line. I mean, they almost take it for granted. They're interacting with students so often. What might an entrepreneur that hasn't done that before? uh be able to learn from from your experience yeah i'm with you on that i wish i could go back in time and just start trying things you know and realizing i could do th things on my like i could take initiative earlier in life one thing that i've seen that's been really interesting and uh, i actually brought my four-year-old to a startup weekend um 
a year and a half ago, right before the pandemic. And of course, like he's too young for it, but he came away asking a lot of questions. So he sat and watched the pitches and then he came away asking a lot of questions. One of the interesting things I've seen is it doesn't need to be Startup Weekend. It's these sort of mini brainstorm sessions, mini hackathons. Sometimes it is Startup Weekends that are happening at high schools and colleges. And now I'm starting to see them happen even um, in elementary. Um, and so it's this model where here's, here's a conundrum, and this is something that the synthesis uses as conundrum. Here's a problem. How would you all solve it together? And, the, and, and, and it's kind of a different way um, in some ways of thinking about, or, or the other prompt is, is to really start a business in a certain area. Here's a problem. How would you start a business to solve this? And so these mini hackathons or startup weekends and seeing them kind of that model popping up earlier. And imagine what that does for kids, because even for adults, when you go to an event like this, which is a weekend event, and you go, usually it's not the company you start. It's the, it's the fact you leave knowing that I could do this. I, I got my feet wet. I can think like this. I, it sort of opens your mind up to realize that you can dream up anything that you want to dream up in the world. And so if we can start kind of instilling that, and I think we're starting to see it, which is really exciting across some of the school districts. Yeah, it was interesting. It felt like we were leaving summer camp, you know, after <laughs> after startup week, and we we've gone through this together. Um, and boy, one of the, my favorite stories that emerged uh, was uh, a friend of ours, Muhammad, uh, over in Iowa City. Uh, he was a, a younger guy working um, in Amazon, making waves, uh, doing more than what people uh, were expecting him to be able to do in that role. And through his experience, he was just kind of given um, uh, just an extra burst of motivation, uh, ended up making a connection through Startup Weekend and was uh, only a few weeks later hired at one of these VC backed companies here in Iowa, uh, working in machine learning, you know, so he was interested in finance and like high tech and was just able to use that experience to really explore and be given like the unnecessary permission to, to go a little bigger into what he was so interested in. So uh, thanks for uh, leaning into that a little bit, Shauna. Now, uh, we have a, a great group with us and we'll, we'll finish with a few questions from the group before we uh, go offline and enjoy a few breakouts together to talk a little bit more in depth. But before we do, I, I like the rapid fire round, right? I'm totally like a game show host or a commentator for sports, whatever you prefer. Uh, but let's do a little rapid fire here. And, and so through the lens of this discussion, um, I'm going to put you in, in the mind of a few different types of people in different places within their life. So are, are you ready? <laughs> All right. So what might you suggest, and this is a very broad, uh, you know, offer, what generally in the wide universe of thought <laughs> would you suggest uh, for parents with young children about to hit the educational system for the first time? Uh, I guess two things. I think we've already talked a little bit about them. Look, look for um, ways that you can supplement based on your child's interests. Because I think I, I have this belief that so many kids have the, this innate interest in different areas that emerges. And if we could just support that at the earliest ages, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to think what might be possible. Um, and then I think the second one is, um, I think to take a, you know, um, a supportive role in the, in the school district. So whatever they're focused on at home, you know, how can you also highlight that through adventures or exploration or, but, but project-based, you know, like how can you bring it to life? in real life. And I think that's when the learning gets really fun. Nice. I see Nancy giving that virtual round of applause to that response. So thank you. Uh, now shifting gears, uh, fast forward a little ways. You're, you're a high school uh, teacher all of a sudden, and you uh, have been tasked with uh, creating a space uh, to allow students to explore entrepreneurship. Um, what are you talking, uh, what are you thinking about as a, a high school educator in that type of a role? Oh, I love this. So I, I am not sure how many here uh, benefited from DECA uh, when you were in school. I am the biggest fan of DECA. So it's something that has existed for years. And, um, and so I would look at what, you know, how can we, how can we create the DECA 2.0? How can we bring that to other 
um, other areas? How can we do these mini, we kind of talked a little bit about it, but like these <clears throat> mini hackathons where the kids can come up with their own ideas and then spend the semester or the quarter working on them, forming teams. And um, I just think that like, I, I recently saw um, some kids pitching who are high school seniors. And the craziest thing was they were better than I would say about 50% of the startup pitches I saw when I was um, at the VC firm. Just the energy and the ideas, of course they weren't as well, the, the, the decks weren't as well um, thought out, but, but the creativity that we have as kids, like why do we lose that? It is the, the most special thing. And so if we can keep supporting that, sorry, I can, I can go off on this topic, but I would do something, I love DECA. I think Greg said something uh, last month that everyone uh, smiled at. He was like, the most successful adults are the children that never died or something like this, you know, a beautiful little thought on maintaining that sense of wonder, uh, but also uh, the vulnerability uh, and the willingness to kind of explore uh, without as many uh, cables connecting you to past experiences. Uh, all right, shifting uh, again, uh, now you're teleporting into a high school student. Oh my goodness, rewind, right, for a lot of us. Now now you're about to uh, go to, you're about to graduate. Oh man, now, now what are you thinking? As far as advice I would give myself? Oh, wow, oh gosh. Um, I would, um, I would try to, you know, I think it's maybe a little bit of, of, of what I ended up doing on accident was just trying to get my foot in the door somewhere. And then in some ways sort of creating my own job the best I could by doing everything I needed to do for my position and then finding other projects that I really liked that I was interested in and trying to pitch myself working on those. Um, because that, that sort of level of experience, I think I learned a lot more than I did in some of my college courses, um, just getting that hands-on experience, but I would try to do it before I graduated college if I could. And I wish I would have done that. Very cool. Very These are great cool. questions. <laughs> so, uh, la last teleportation into the mindset of a college professor, um, or perhaps a, a veteran within education as they continue to, um, you know, reinvent themselves as they're guiding their students. What do we, what are we thinking about as far as, uh, uh, you know, thoughts or suggestions for this type of individual? So I'm a college professor. Uh, correct. Okay. And you've been in the game for a while. Okay. Uh, Ooh, wow. Okay. I would, um, you know, I would have, um, everyone in my class uh in some way go like support mentor help at a local school and i would have them do a lot of listening uh these the the kids in the class i would want them to remember that there's all kinds of ideas and, and creativity that can happen at a younger age you don't have to kind of get into this set way of thinking i think it, i would just try to give as many reminders as i could that that um, to, to what you just said of the idea that, um, you know, the, the sort of spirit and creativity that kids have, as well as just being an active member of the community and kind of knowing that, um, that we're all supporting each, each, each other in this community. So I feel like I would wanna remind them of those two things. A couple more questions, then we'll open up the grid view and have questions uh, from folks who have joined us this afternoon. Uh, thinking about the folks even on this call, how, how can educators collaborate? Um, we, we look at like the startup community way, the uh, latest from Brad Feld and Ian Hathaway, looking at like the positive sum mindset and uh, building from within and uh, supporting each other in a collaborative approach to economic development. How can that translate uh, within the educational environment, both in the K through 12, uh, the earlier years, but how does that wrinkle of tuition somehow change that narrative and can we still be collaborative while uh you know uh, being in the uh higher educational environments so how can we be collaborative oh so uh, yeah um well you know one thing that i will say there has never been a better time like we all saw what the biden administration just came out with there is there is an influx of funding and there has never been an openness like there is right now for for small changes, let's say, you know, they don't have to be massive changes, 
but in the interest of kids in the interest of of the educators what benefits them i think you know everybody's ears are open i've had school districts reaching out i've had city council members reaching out i've had so many people reaching out over the last year asking me what can we do together how can we change this and i think one thing that i wish is i wish i was actually on the inside so i could have both of those points of view i think um it's going to take leaders from both sides working together not only you know educators working together and administrators working together but then looking at like what are other models that are working out there and how can we help kids right now and parents because parents are demanding different types of things but i feel like there's a massive sense of urgency because there's what have we got you know maybe six months where we're going to be figuring this out we're going to be figuring out how the, the funds are going to be allocated across every state um, but I'm seeing all kinds of openings right now for grants and for different ways of, of um, uh, you know, of schooling, of looking at how we can support kids. You know, we look at the learning loss that's coming out and, and a lot of these, these areas that a lot of people care, care deeply about. And so there's sort of never been a better time. So if, if there's anyone that has an idea across any sector, um, I think that, you know, there's, there's an interesting opening right now to, to think about how to, how to collaborate in a different way. It's interesting how you mentioned uh, kind of the, uh, the the synonym of being an entrepreneur and allowing, you know, them to lead from within. And does this help an entrepreneur? If the answer is yes, then it's probably good for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. If the answer is no, perhaps it's misguided or self-serving. Um, I think of uh, this graphic that you're looking at here, where that entrepreneur sits in the center. Um, and so your startups and small businesses, uh, you know, wrap around these individuals. We look at the seven capitals and then the different nodes on the outside are some of your common actors uh, throughout the ecosystem. And so obviously uh, educational organizations uh, are a big piece of this ever evolving complex puzzle. But if you were to replace entrepreneurs there in that center of this pinwheel with students, and as decisions are made, bringing them into the conversation, uh, allowing uh, the uh, initiatives to continuously be guided by those that you serve, who that's easier said than done. Um, but it, it's an interesting perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, one, one or two more questions as you think forward. Um, I ask this question to a lot of folks in this realm and I'm always uh, interested in the uh, kind of the, the thoughts around what can students learn in school um, in their educational environment that they cannot be taught by the internet, uh, that cannot be taught by personal experiences and interactions uh, that they have for themselves. Oh gosh, so many things. Um, and, 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 I, and this is an, a, quite a focus area for me because my focus is early child education. So I'm focused on kids who are one to eight years old and, and, and even, you know, even a sweeter spot is one to six years old. And we can't put them in front of screens. This is not, you know, a group that, you know, is, is going to be able to learn the basics of how to learn in front of a screen. And so I think that there's, you know, they learn a lot from you know, young children learn, learn a lot from parents and they learn a lot from their experiences um, in their families, but they, you know, at that young age, they are learning to how to like, you know, how to, how to love learning later in life. They're learning how to socialize. They're learning how to work out their feelings. They're learning how to communicate. Um, and I think, you know, there are elements of those things that you can learn online. Um, but if you miss out on, on and one of the reasons why the Biden administration said that, you know, pre-K is so important, um, because if you look at the research on kids that, that, that have, that go, to, that go to preschool and those that don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite different. And so there's, there's a huge advantage for kids who can have that, that experience. And so my main focus is, has really been early childhood education, but I, um, I, I see some startups trying to move that online and I, you know, I, completely disagree with that at that age. I think that um, that that's gets really interesting when you're sort of K through eight, then and you know, even K, you know, you're, you're still like learning a lot in person. But I think then you can start to supplement a lot of these things um, with online learning. But, um, you know, really, the 
a lot of what we're focused on today, um, you know, we've we've learned a lot of our our main skills by um, by being in school, being around other people. I'm going to kick it uh, into grid view. So be ready uh, for those of you in the room. If you have a question, we want to create a little space to finish uh, with uh, thoughts from the group. Um, before we do, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share. A, I, I kind of am a futurist. I like thinking deep future, but also recognizing that even uh, 10 minutes from now, five, year, uh, five years from now, uh, th those uh, type of thoughts uh, are always interesting as well. And so I'm curious what you think education looks like in 10 years, um, and then translate that 50 years, just for fun. This would be a great question for everyone on the call too. Um, <clears throat> did you say five years and 50 years? Yeah, how about that? Okay. <laughs> I mean, we could go like tomorrow, <laughs> the next day. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it with some uh, high level we spend, uh, spend the next hour going through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, let's brainstorm it. Um, you know, I think, you know, in the next years, let's say five years, we are going to see kids who are, we have a blend of hybrid and, and in person learning when we think about K through eight. We're also going to see, I think, a lot of those services that are focused from the school's angle, a lot of those becoming hybrid just because of funding, as well as just the, you know, the, the area of specialty being able to be so much better when you can tap into expertise that aren't, that aren't in your actual school. Um, I think about tutoring, you know, uh, many of you probably know the, um, the, the, the Two Sigma um, research that was done, um, Bloom's Two Sigma, and I know there's, there's been some debate on it, but the idea that kids do so much better when they're, when they have a tutor, you know, two standard deviations better was what that research showed. And so I think with the focus on um, high voltage tutoring over the pandemic, I think that's just going to become sort of a norm. Um, I think personalized learning, we're going to see AI, um, different AI technologies develop focused on personalized learning, which I think we should all be very active in. We should all be following that and very active in because it can go well or it can be scary. And it's all based on how the algorithm is built and educators need to be involved in that process. I really believe that. So I think we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of that. We're going to see a lot more game based learning, a lot more project based learning. We're going to I think we're going to see a little bit more um, learning outside because people are going to then turn away from the screens and want to have a, a much more of a focus on forest schools and outdoor learning, which is which has been a big focus coming out of the pandemic as well. Um, there's a there, we're going to see more world schooling and unschooling. So a lot of these alternative areas where um, kids are traveling and learning, you know, the, those that can that can afford it. Um, so I think we're just going to see we're, we're going to see you know, there's still, I think there's still going to be the, the general uh, public schools, but we're going to see bigger sectors than we've ever seen in the past of these different alternative schooling models. And I think slowly those will be accepted by public schools. Parts of those will be accepted by public schools too. Mm -hmm. 50 Personalized years, yeah. learning. Very, very interesting to think about all the different ways that that can apply. I also think of peer to peer uh, being able to apply that personal interest with others who share uh, that as a, 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 a efficient way of personal growth. Uh, I want to kick it out to the group here. We've got a collection of wonderful and remarkable people. Uh, and so if there are questions that linger, curdy has got that virtual hand up. Uh, so we'll start with her. That's Curtie. actually my real hand. <laughs> oh, that's true. I, it's all the same, I guess. These are, you, two enjoyed, uh, you two enjoyed a fun fireside chat uh, during Startup Weekend Iowa a month or so ago. Uh, that continues to be one of the highlights of our time together from that event. Uh, but yeah. now you've got another chance to ask a, a question of Shauna. What's on your mind? You know, what's on my mind is the discrepancy between the haves and the have nots. So I think, and haves, you know, when it comes to virtual learning, haves doesn't mean the 1%. There's a lot more in that, right? But for those whose, um, parent literally school is the place where the parents can leave their kids for the day everyone is just mm -hmm. like there's no time to organize special projects or whatever um making sure that some of the things you just talked about is equitable across society do you know who's working on that who's talking about that like 
I'll tell you, my public school system here, I mean, we have a change coming up with our superintendent, but still there, it's been really hard for the school administrators to um, implement some of these great ideas, even though technology is there today, people are throwing, hey, I'll give you free Wi-Fi access, they're getting equipment to everyone it's still really hard. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that if you've heard anyone talking about it. Yeah, no, it's a question I get asked in, in different ways quite often and I think is, has been such a hot topic, especially throughout the pandemic. You know, um, it's, I do think it's one of the things in many ways to be hopeful about is, you know, in some ways the, the move to more online has, has in some, ways democratized learning, meaning like Khan Academy is, you know, seen as one example. I know um, the person who's over at YouTube working on education. And so there's a new focus there on education. And so when we think about access, you know, it has opened up access. Also, I think the other thing that makes me hopeful is how much money the, um, the current administration has put into schools that are focused, schooling that's focused specifically on that sector. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like once the money's there, you know, I, and the funding's there to support that, we we're saying that's important to us as a country. It's it's a little bit harder to take that money away when it's there, you know. Um, it's it's sort of an essential service. Um, so those are the things that I think I'm hopeful about. And then a lot of the apps and and some of the um, different things coming out right now, you know, are free or pretty low cost. Um, so the, I guess those are the the areas that I'm. I'm, I'm hopeful about that I see. Um, there's also a, a, an example here in, um, in Seattle, there's also a lot of niche examples. So there's one called Ada Developers Academy that's focused on um, women learning the code, women coming out of other um, sectors, learning how to code and make you know three or four times as much as they were making before um, going right into a job at Facebook or Google. Um, so there's we're starting to see those type of niche um, um, sort of mini schools pop up as well. Um, but Kirby, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen anything too. Well, I mean, Nancy is doing this and, and I think she's planning on growing it here um, to larger, but just I'm thinking about at scale, how do we get people who don't necessarily have parents who are gonna figure out how to organize all this project-based learning or uh, prompt the child who's at home doing online learning to actually get excited about it or, you know, just those kinds of things. So um, the, uh, the one thing that I have it just, it, it seems like parents who are networked and in the know help their kids and those who aren't don't. And so getting enough scale out there to help those kids is really what I'm hoping for. So yeah. Well yeah. said. Mm. Thanks, right. Katie. That was a great question. And uh, I know Mark had shared a quick thought uh, in our chat. So I uh, invited him to pop onto the spotlighted stage and share his thought or question. Uh, kick it over to you, Mark. And you're so generous, and I just I love being in these kinds of events with you. You're such a natural at this. It's really, really fun. Uh, Shauna, what a pleasure to meet you, and I'm not buying it at all that you're in Seattle with all that sunniness happening behind you there. Um, I, maybe that's a prop, right? Is that one of those artificial screens behind you? Everybody in this city is in a great mood today because it's sunny. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I did make a comment about uh, individualized adaptive learning. I'd like to back into that by, by first uh, just sort of echoing um, what, what uh, Curdy was just talking about. I, I'm real interested in um, success and equity um, and student engagement. And uh, the student engagement part I, th part I think is interesting because we often ask students, well, how, how engaged are you? Or I think they hear how much work are you, are you being asked to complete? And, and I worry that sometimes I think it's like the farmer asking the pig uh, whether for dinner there should be pork, right? They kind of come at it with a little bit of a bias, right? So I don't know how we get at the engagement thing, but I suspect if there were an objective way, we would find the work that you're doing is really hitting them at that higher engagement level. And that's an important piece of the puzzle for where we are today and where we're going into the future. 
Um, but the success and equity piece, I think, is really important for all the entrepreneurs um, because as we're deploying and we're having an opportunity to, to uh, vet products and, and ideas, uh, pre and post test, gathering data, gathering uh, um, quotes and testimonials from end users, it's important. It's important for marketing. It's important for sharing the good news. I think it's really important as educators um, that, that we're able to see uh, results driven uh, recommendations, right? Um, there's so much noise and you may have the right answer, but if, if I, as an administrator, I'm getting 50 emails a day, I don't have time to vet all of those to find the answer that, that is legit that's out there. Um, those were just random thoughts that I had. The individualized adaptive learning, I'll just briefly summarize by saying, uh, our ability to create inference engines like, we did, like, like they do with you know, Amazon when I'm shopping and spending far too much at 2 a.m. Uh, to serve up what we need, right? Uh, coupled with the ability to, when we discover a student has a gap, scaffold to that learning, right? Those two things coming together on an individual basis, I think that's where, certainly that's where um, um, there's a lot of growth for, for education and in particular higher ed. Uh, and I think there's, I think that opens the door for a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, I'm thinking of one company uh, that I was, I was involved with recently called Newton. Um, and one of the things that they did, I love this, you guys, they have a single fee that allows a student, uh, they tested this at the University of Texas in San Antonio, a, a student get their full four-year degree uh, using the same Newton platform. And it's essentially like they're buying a textbook, but there's no textbook. They do all the online learning. And the machine learning that happens as we discover what kind of a learner you are and what, what you need um, carries over to the next class that you're taking. And so it already starts out as if it's, a, as if it's the professor who's having you a second time around. And it continues all the way through the four-year degree. So think about it, you, you're taking now organic chemistry, but it already has the information for what your weak spots were in algebra, right? And so it can make sure to serve back up to you reinforcements for the things that maybe weren't strengths in prior semesters. That's the kind of smart future that I think um, is, is, is coming to us, right? And I really hope that Iowa entrepreneurs um, find those kinds of opportunities and make the most of them. Um, so those were just random thoughts. Ben, thank you so much for giving me a chance to jump in with those. I was just taking notes. That was so. That was that was great. I totally agree with you. Yeah, that was uh, that was sharp as always, Mark. Uh, you have a way with words, but also a true understanding uh, that goes far beyond the jargon. So thank you for uh, stopping by and, and sharing that thought. Um, if the group doesn't have any more uh, questions, we'll go ahead and start closing things down, uh, knowing that the audience uh, for these uh, meetups are folks interested in the intersections between education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Uh, Shauna, as we close things down, I'd like to create some space to uh, give you the stage one more time to share any closing thoughts, uh, things that uh, you'd like to leave with this group. Uh, and uh, once again, it's been great to have you join us uh, for this and uh, looking forward to continuing to collaborate uh, between our different uh, worlds that have seemed to become perhaps one. Uh, so thank you for joining us and I'll, I'll let you close us uh, out here today. Yeah, I, you know, I only wanted to say one thing, which is um, if any of you have any ideas following up on this, you know, our focus is tech supported classrooms. So there's an educator, but the technology is supporting and um, we're an early stage startup. So if you're seeing anything or you have any ideas, like, you know, we're always looking for new opportunities and looking at how we can use our technology. So shoot me a note, shoot me an email, you know, send me a, a Twitter, a Twitter DM. Ooh, and thanks for having me join. This was great. Yeah, that's, that's probably a, one more quick question for you is, is Twitter the best way for folks uh, to connect with you uh, beyond this conversation? You know, Twitter's great. I'm at Shauna Kazi um, or LinkedIn's great too. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, Shauna, thanks again for joining us. Uh, and this has been a treat of a discussion, a caffeinated conversation, if you will. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>